today, four interesting ingredients that I don't think we've covered on the show before. The first one is under the cloche. Shall we be the judge on whether they're interesting? L let's be. Yes, okay, that's fine. That's what we're here to do. It's our job. I don't advise you shot it, but you might want to sniff it, taste it. It's got an oily viscosity. It's got an oily, almost nut oil smell. Mm. Cheers. You said oily. What do you think now? Wow, syrupy. Yeah, wow, hang got... on a second, it's honey -y. Yeah, it's really sweet. It's sweet like honey, but there is a sort of a, a woody undertone. Mm. I can't w work out whether there's some sort of like, almost citrusy or slightly acidic. Zing. Yeah. So this is willow syrup. Willow syrup? From the willow tree. As in made from musk willow trees. So the flowers are harvested and then basically infused into a sugar syrup. So it is incredibly syrupy, but it is made with musk willow flowers. Now willow has been foraged and used often for what was believed to be medicinal purposes for many, many, many hundreds of years. And all parts of the willow tree are technically edible. Now, they're not necessarily all particularly nice or um, useful, but they're all edible. The flowers, delicious. Do you know how I describe that? It's like um, a syrup with a white wine mm. element to it. I know exactly what you Do mean. Do you know what I mean? It's on the nose. It, yeah. it smells it more than tastes it. This is from Egypt. And we're arcing back to, wait for it, 1500 BC. Mm. We're talking ancient Egyptian communities, Mesopotamia, and it was there that they believed it had medicinal properties. And still, to this day, people say that if you chew on willow, it'll get rid of headaches and the alike. Now, it liked it particularly, especially along rivers so that the Nile and the like because of the wetter environments there. But fast forward, it's now used in all sorts of desserts, sweets, baked goods or mixed into drinks. Think anywhere you'd use rose water or orange blossom water, willow syrup has the same role. It is very syrupy on its own, but would have had to use it a bit like a cordial with lots of lovely citrus and some sparkle in a box out. Ooh. So I've given you a fuzzy peach. Citrus, grapefruit, ice, tonic water, and then your syrup. Mix to taste. Muddle the peach with some of your syrup. It's not doing anything, if I'm honest. <laughs> Brilliant. Art. Nailed it. And occasionally we get comments saying we're no good at cocktails. <laughs> what do they mean? I mean, look at that. 12 pounds, please. Well, I think you should go first, seeing as you created that. Oh, cheers. It's got quite a lot of grapefruit in it now. Do you need some syrup? I need some more syrup, actually. Obviously mixed to taste, those of you who like the bitter quinine and, and more bitter grapefruit, I'm a big fan of a bitter cocktail. Otherwise, lean more to the fruity sweetie side. Take this peach skin that you sucked. That is damn delicious. It is really nice, isn't well it? Well done, that is really nicely yeah. balanced now. So you can forage all the parts of a willow tree, but it is the musk willow and the flowers of that that make this willow syrup. Can you taste it? I think I can. And I think it's that white winey profile that I was talking about. It's floral, but it's not, it's not fruity. I think that's it. It's the sweetness along with a little bit of summer else going on. Yeah, you, you can still taste it despite the other strong flavours going on. It's really nice. So not it as distinct really nice. as an elderflower perhaps, but no. you're saying almost like a, a muscadet kind of vibe. If you have a white wine made from muscadet, it tastes winey, it has that kind of floral flavour. Yeah, it's like grape, like grape. It's sweet, mm. but it's subtle, isn't it, as a flavour. Now, whether you're making Egyptian delight or drizzling it over kind of baklava or a similar kind of nut and pastry based uh, dish, or in a mocktail, do you think it's something you might adopt at home? I mean, do you already use blossom waters, rose water, orange blossom waters? No. No. But I could definitely imagine using that with other fruits, but like a sharp fruit to counterbalance the two flavours. I think that would be absolutely delicious. 
An ingredient with a talking point, you may see it on uh, cocktail menus uh, in fancy restaurants, but classically in so many baked goods. That's number one, would you like a second? Yes, please. Number two. Let's see if you've seen this before. Curly uh, cheese. Yeah, grated cheese. So it instantly looks like mozzarella yeah. string. I thought it might be vegetal, but it isn't. It is, it's cheese. Can we? You may. What's your first reaction? Really salty. It's halloumi. That is much stronger tasting than I expected it to be. From looking at it, I thought it was mozzarella, which dried mozzarella doesn't really taste of that much, does it? But that is salty AF. But I don't think it's got a flavour. I think it's just, it's the, just been brined. Drying. Is it mozzarella that's been brined in brine? Grated and brined mozzarella. It's called Chechil, and it's originally from Armenia. It is cheese that is made in a very similar style to mozzarella, and then it is brined. Mm. So you're spot on with that. So it's Chef. sold in jars of brine, and we are talking like 7% brine, wow. so really very salty. And as a result, delicious, but perfect to pair with snacking boards. Oh, I bet this is gonna be great. Oh, yes, please. So you'll often find the brined cheese, Chechil, in jars on the side of bars in Eastern Europe and, and, and Armenia especially, where there is quite literally thousands of years of cultural cheese making practices. Right, so this is a bar snack? Among other things. So it can be melted into dishes and used, but more often it's just paired with bread, olives, beer, as a beer snack. It's salty, it's cheesy, but this is It works with an cheese. IPA. Does it work with an IPA? Oh, it really does, doesn't it? Mm. Cheers. Because mm -hmm. it's really, really salty, mm. you do want something to kind of Counter. take the edge off that. What's the, what's our sauce? Honey. Oh, okay. Oh, it's a really dark, sticky honey. Now, you can also imagine with a nice bit of bread, perhaps a rye bread. We think it originated in Armenia. It's now spread to all sorts of neighbouring countries. You may find it in Turkey, in Georgia, but it is that kind of stringy, cheese that's then brined. Sometimes it can be cold smoked. So another oh, version that... we've got of it is braided. Mm. Oh. Oh, wow. Oh, mate, that is awesome. That looks like a fancy octopus. So these are thin strands wrapped. Yeah, so it's, it's basically cheese that's stretched the same way as that first cheese, which is very similar to mozzarella as you first mentioned, but then it's cold smoked and braided. So see what you make of the cold smoked Armenian version. That is. Oh, that's delicious. Damn good. <laughs> Again, it's another one that works wonderfully with like roasted or grilled or even steamed vegetables, mm. uh, as well as just in a bar setting like you have in front of you. So it can be cooked with, but I think most of the time it's just considered a delicious beer snack. The smoke obviously adds an amazing flavour. Slightly dries out mm. the cheese, but then you've still got the bouncy, chewy, mozzarella-y texture. But then it also takes the edge off the salt, but the salt's still there. Yeah. So overall, it just ends up being amazing. I think I prefer the non-smoked. Do version. you? I yeah. love that. I think that's amazing. Just because I feel like that's more unique, whereas this takes on a lot of the smoke. Mm. Incredibly Moorish, and I can see why you'd put it on a bar, because I imagine you'd sell more beer as a result. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I want to drink more. Excellent. Well, I can see you're having fun. Mm. But would mm -hmm. you like number three? In a minute. Over to you. Where in the globe are we going next? Tebus took our beer. Oh, yeah. Ebbers, did you pull these out of the ground before they were supposed to? I mean, they look like a cross between a carrot and a potato. So they do grow under the ground, spot on. They're a root vegetable. Root vegetable. They're not a root vegetable. Ah. No. By all means, try some. Can be eaten raw or transformed into a paste or a powder or cooked into things, but it can be eaten raw. It's considered to have incredible anti-inflammatory and antimicrobial uh, properties, which things like turmeric do as well. It's tasty. 
It's a bit like ginger in the sense that it's a rhizome, not a root vegetable. It's watery, almost like a, a water chestnut. Yeah, yeah or a in radish. Texture. For me, it's giving me like radish texture. Radish texture with ginger vibes. Ginger yeah, meets warmth turmeric. Of mm. Warmth of ginger, some turmeric, and then it tastes soapy afterwards. It is, botanically speaking, a rhizome, which means it grows under the ground continuously across, horizontal. So the same way that ginger would, you can snap it off and it keeps growing. So rather than a root that goes down, it grows parallel to the ground but underneath, and then will send up shoots. Despite the fact that it's a rhizome, it's called finger root. Finger root. Finger because root. they look like fingers and they root around under the soil. Now, you'll find them in a lot of cuisine around Indonesia, Vietnam, Laos, Thailand, but we're gonna put them in a dish today that might be considered Cambodia's national dish. Nice. Excellent. Essentially, it's a coconut fish curry that's steamed in banana leaf, but it has that finger root giving the paste so much body. So the paste you've got on the side there, uncooked, that's all the kind of suspects you'd expect in a, a curry paste of that region, but the body of it is the finger root. So the white bit on top is coconut cream and rice powder or rice flour mixed together to form a paste on top that also steams, but the coconut is also all through the curry. It smells unbelievable. Cheers. Cheers. Oh my. Wow, that's great. Wow. And it should be light and fluffy. It's got one egg in there as well, but think of the coconut cream with the egg and the fish. It's a cross between like a fish mousse and a fish curry. Fish mousse doesn't sound great to me, but I know what you mean. It's so silky. It's got a texture of ring dang. Which is a lot of sort of almost like shredded or desiccated coconut. And this uses the coconut cream, but with the finger root texture. That with like some gal and gal or ginger, lemongrass, like you can feel all of that coming together. The lime leaves, yeah. chili, garlic. That is just incredible. It tastes like it contains the most interesting ginger you've ever tasted. Yeah. And finger root comes from the same kind of family as ginger, it is a rhizome, they behave very similarly. Now it's steamed in banana leaf, which obviously imparts another flavor. It's quite fiddly to do with kind of toothpicks to tie it all together and create a boat in it. But we have also seen versions where you just use a stapler and you basically get your <laughs> banana leaf and you staple a boat together because what goes in is quite wet. Mm. And then as it steams, the egg and the fish proteins cook and it holds it all together. So you need to steam it in that kind of banana boat. I'm going to put it out there. It's one of the best things I've eaten all year. Really? This is one of the best dishes wow. I've had this year. One of Cambodia's national dishes. But the finger root can also be used in soups, curries, uh, stews, and or eaten raw. So just on the side, raw as a crunchy, almost vegetable. And because it's wow. so unique as a cooking method, as well as the ingredient we use so rarely, if ever, the finger root in the UK, if you ever go to a Cambodian cooking school, this is often the one that's demonstrated because there's a few different processes. From making that original paste, then combining it with the coconut cream and the egg and the fish, and then topping it off with the coconut cream and rice flour before steaming it in a boat you've had to make. It's kind of involved, but for that reason, it's loved. Imagine if the country you are from had that for their national dish, being British. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Can you imagine if we had something that good? What about the finger root on its own? If you could get hold of it, you, you can order it online, and especially stores, you'll be able to pick it up. But if you had it, would you use it more often? Would I replace root ginger with it? I don't, I think if you replaced it, it would be a very different product. It's not as fiery as that. For me, that's a cross between a mellow ginger, right, radish. So it's a supplement. Yeah, but I think sliced and chopped into a salad as a raw vegetable on the side, delicious, mm. super nutritious. Well, as delicious as that was, if you've got room for one more, I have one. If you can top that. Yeah, then challenge on. We are there. Last one, boys. Behold. Lemony Christmas stockings on a stalk. <laughs> can be eaten raw, can be steamed, can be stir fried into things. It tastes, uh, it's like a pea. Yes. That is exactly what I was hoping you would say. So often described as succulent, sweet, and similar to that of pea when raw. So they're called Dok Sano, used a lot in Thailand, where they're grown all year round and they're picked from, bear with me, the Sespania bispinosa plant. 
They can be eaten raw and in salads. They can be stir fried. Sometimes they're even used in sweet dishes, mm. but we're going to give them to you in one of their most classic uses, an omelette. Oh. So a dish that's called Doxano omelette, essentially egg that's beaten and seasoned with the likes of oyster sauce, soy sauce, a little bit of raw garlic, and then loads and loads and loads of those flours, and then cooked in a really high heat. Mm. They give a really nice texture when yeah. they're cooked, actually. They've got more of a bite to them than I expected. Raw, like you said, they taste like sweet pea. Once they're cooked, even more subtle of a flavour, they kind of provide more of a body and a crunch and probably take on the flavours of those around them. Mike, that's more of a sort of a, a salad or vegetable side. They're just steamed um, okay. and uh, mixed with a little bit of oyster sauce just for seasoning. Well, they really do um, have an al dente bite to them now. Whereas yeah. When they're like that, they almost just dissolve a little bit. Whereas there's a really nice bite to them now. They definitely take on the flavours of everything that you put with them. If you think about Thailand as a whole, it is actually the, the provincial flower of this region that I'm not even going to try and pronounce. <laughs> but they're grown all year round in Thailand, so it's one of those kind of ubiquitous, you, ubiqu I, I tried to ubiquitous. use that one on screen as well. I tried to say <laughs> is that. that another, is that more Thai? Oh. Ubiquitous, ubiquitous vegetables. I think like the them. texture's nicer when they're steamed, but the pea flavour is stronger when they're raw. So 100% throwing those through salads and things just to give a bit of an extra dimension, make yeah. something boring more interesting, then that, that could definitely work. I, I would definitely do that. Now, perhaps when we're talking about the previous three cloche lifts, so Egypt, Armenia and Cambodia, we're less familiar in the UK with those cuisines full stop, so they are new to us. That's a typically Thai ingredient. Is that new to you? It's completely new, but at the same time, really familiar. But I think it's really familiar because of the British pea element rather than having this in sort of Thai cuisine. There's a few stores in and around London and or online stores that can provide all of these kind of very, very traditional, authentic ingredients. And actually, they're not very expensive. You just need to know where to look. Those ones are fresh and they come in little um, packets, the same as you would buy fresh herbs. Yeah, cool. A little bit of colour as well for garnish. Yeah, Actually, definitely. that would make stuff look really cool. Tasty garnish. Well, there nice. you go. Four brand new global ingredients to us. But how many of those had you previously seen? Comment down below. And if there are more ingredients that we mm. should absolutely be tackling and tasting, scribble those down too. <laughs>